Oh. But he's also he's riding for Massachusetts. Jim. There's a seat here. Yeah, grab in. These are the hey, Dems and Republicans. What? For the Dems? Yeah, but there's no one here, so it's fine. Too bad. Nice to see you. Can you nice to meet you? Oh, hey, yes, of course. How are you? Uh, how are you? Are you uh, how, how was that? Uh, it was uh, great. It was all, uh, well, I left Friday the next day. Okay. I was only there for the other. So, what's going on? How long are you, Josh, trying to figure out a bunch of stuff? Uh, I just I went to the next day. Yes, and Phil Sharp. 
Oh no, someone else. Oh, they didn't have a What? Ramesh Panuru.
leave early for the. Uh, Thank you. 
Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Elon Graf. I'm a senior here at Harvard College and president of the Student Advisory Committee of the Institute of Politics. Tonight, it is my privilege and pleasure to welcome you here to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum for what promises to be an amazing panel. This morning, I was teaching civics to a group of eighth graders in a Boston public school. Uh, we were talking about what makes this country great. And something that the students kept coming back to was that in America, everybody matters. Elected officials might put forth their vision for what makes a more perfect union, but it's we the people who make it happen. Tonight, we have the unique opportunity to hear from some of the individuals most responsible for ensuring that that process works, the journalists and campaign decision makers who bring the candidate's message to the people, share the issues, and the hopes that they will cast an informed vote for the best possible leader. They're democracy's microphones, 
And tonight, we'll have the opportunity to hear what they have to say. It's now my pleasure to introduce Congressman Phil Sharp. Uh, he, his lifetime of public service includes 20 years representing the people of the great state of Indiana. He's been with us as acting director here at, the, here at the Institute for about six months, and while working with students for six months might have seemed like 20 years, uh, we have been incredibly grateful for every single moment we've had with him. Uh, Congressman Sharp. Well, thank you very much, Ilan. Uh, Ilan is one of our, uh, is actually president of our student advisory committee to the Institute of Politics and uh, is an example of what we do at the Institute of Politics. It was founded as the memorial to President Kennedy in 1966, designed to help encourage uh, our young people to become engaged in civics and engaged in the political life of the country. And uh, you've just seen a sterling example of that. Well, tonight's forum kicks off uh, the Institute's conference uh, called uh, Campaign for President, the Managers Look at 2004. And this is designed to bring together presidential campaign managers, uh, political journalists, and analysts uh, to review the campaign strategies and the decision making that went on over the last couple years. The Institute has uh, held this conference every four years since 1972 and always publishes a transcript about the event uh, following, obviously. And our goal really is to try to help future candidates and future managers and journalists, scholars, and interested citizens to better understand the nature of these extraordinary enterprises called congressional, or excuse me, showing my own life, uh, presidential campaigns. I never was in the presidential camp. Um, so tonight, as uh, one camp celebrates victory and prepares for the inauguration, and the other camp prepares to fight for another day, uh, we've gathered together two campaign managers, as well as two top journalists, to hear some of the war stories of the campaign 2004. Now, our goal tonight is not to relive the key moments in this hard-fought contest. That will happen tomorrow. Uh, and instead, our panelists have been asked to take us uh, into the campaign and share with our student audience and others uh, the exhilaration, the agony of the race, and offer some insights into this uniquely American process. I'm delighted to be able to introduce uh, Mary Beth Cahill. Uh, she's a native of Massachusetts. Uh, she first got her uh, feet wet in politics as a child, but then later working for Congressman uh, Robert F. Drinan, the last Roman Catholic priest in the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, she has successfully managed a number of uh, races for the U.S. House and Senate, whether it's in Massachusetts, Vermont, Rhode Island, and Oregon. She, uh, for five years, ran the em Emily's List, uh, the nation's largest political action committee. Uh, most recently, she was chief of staff to uh, Senator Edward Kennedy, and before that, she was an assistant to President Clinton, uh, working as the director of public liaison in the White House. Uh, she was widely uh, credited with stabilizing and focusing uh, Senator Kerry's campaign in November uh, 2003 when she uh, took over the, the reins as campaign manager. We're delighted to have her with us tonight, Mary Beth Cahill. <clears throat> Next to Mary Beth is uh, uh, our, one of our key journalists, uh, Glenn Johnson, who also hails from here in Massachusetts, had worked for a number of newspapers before he uh, be, uh, took up uh, the camp of Associated uh, Press, where he covered uh, Senator John Kerry during his re-election re campaign uh, when he was challenged by then-Governor William Weld. In 1999, he moved to the Washington office of the AP to cover uh, Governor uh, uh, George Bush's uh, run for the presidency, which of course was successful. Uh, the next year in 2000, uh, he moved uh, to the Boston Globe where he is today, and he covered uh, in 2000 the presidential race as well as the Florida recount. And this last year, of course, he's been covering Senator Kerry during both the primary and the general election. Please welcome Glenn Johnson. Ken Melman, our next uh, panelist, uh, got his start in politics while he was attending Harvard Law School, uh, where he worked in uh, uh, Bill Weld's gubernatorial campaign in 1990 when Republicans uh, won a uh, blue state uh, for the governorship that year. Uh, he's originally from Baltimore. He's practiced law in Washington, D.C. He's worked on Capitol Hill. He's worked in many uh, campaigns across the country in a variety of states from Massachusetts to Georgia and Texas and uh, Virginia. 
Uh, in, he worked in both the 1992 uh, uh, President Bush uh, re-election uh, re -election campaign and the 1996 Dole campaign. Uh, in 2000, he was a national field director for the Bush-Cheney campaign and later became deputy assistant to the President of the United States, uh, where he was director of the White House Political Affairs uh, Office. Uh, just recently, he has thrown his hat in the ring for another race uh, uh, to be elected, uh, he hopes, uh, by the uh, Republican National committee to be its uh, chairman, and he uh, got the public endorsement of the President of the United States, so one might suspect we know the outcome of that election. Um, he, um, we're very pleased to welcome back to Harvard uh, the uh, President Bush and Vice President Cheney's campaign manager, Ken Melman. <laughs> Ramesh Paneru uh, grew up in Kansas City and graduated uh, summa cum laude from Princeton University. Uh, he has published articles in virtually every major newspaper in the United States, and he's written major pieces uh, for magazines such as Policy Review, The Weekly Standard, The New Republic, and Reason. Uh, he's been a fellow at the Institute of Economic Affairs in London and uh, a media fellow at the Stanford University's uh, Hoover Institution. Uh, during the most recent campaign, he covered President Bush for the National Review. Please welcome Ramesh Paneru. As is customary in the forum, uh, we'll have a few uh, interchanges uh, among ourselves up here, which you're welcome to listen in, obviously, uh, and then we'll open it up to questions from our audience. Uh, these campaigns, of course, involve uh, heavy-duty conflict not only with each other, uh, but within them. Uh, but we're not going to go there tonight. Uh, this is a softball night, uh, at least the opening's part of it will be. And um, uh, so we've asked them just to share with us a few of the lighter moments uh, and, and essentially to give us a, a sense of what funny things happened. We heard about a lot of the hardball, serious things that happened. Uh, what funny things happened or what were special moments to them? So let me ask uh, Ken first to kick it off. Sure. Uh Two, two moments. One was one of my favorite moments in the campaign was, was and we mentioned this when we were just on Inside Politics for tomorrow, I gave you a plug. Uh, <laughs> one of my favorite moments was the uh, convention, the President's acceptance speech. A whole lot of effort had been put into laying out an agenda for a new term, and we thought it was important to do that because the President very much wanted to be able to claim a mandate. And the uh, President gave what I thought was a great speech. We had ads ready, we had a book ready, we had a tour ready to discuss it, and that was a really important moment because so many different people came together to make it possible. In terms of a funny moment, um, uh, one of my earliest moments was uh, uh, we had a guy named Mercer Reynolds who was our finance chairman. Great guy. Uh, he had been ambassador to Switzerland and before that was a very successful businessman. And this was someone, and I'm sure Mary Beth had similar folks who were leading their finance effort who was used to uh, living a certain style of life. <laughs> and for those who worked on the Bush campaign, they may know I am I consider myself frugal. They have other words for it. And uh, <laughs> Mercer showed up at the office, and I told him what a great office he had. He had a cube. And uh, then uh, his first act as finance chairman was to proceed to fly on his corporate plane from one place to another place, which I presented to tell him he couldn't do. He had to fly on Southwest Airlines. <laughs> and when he arrived at BWI at about 12.30 at night, I received a telephone call that was not very pleasant but it was a welcome to the campaign world for him, and he did a fabulous job, and the whole team did a fabulous job, but uh, making the ambassador to Switzerland understand what it meant to fly coach on Southwest was a very humorous moment for me, <laughs> probably not so humorous for him. I, I trust that was to meet the rules of the <laughs> campaign. Well, it was to make sure we didn't spend a lot of money. <laughs> Mary Beth, do you have uh, similar moments that you... Uh... Well, when I think back about the campaign, one very big moment for me was um, the morning of the Iowa caucuses. You know, there had been a lot in the press about how, who was actually ahead. Was it Dean? Was Gebhardt moving up? You know, who had the most on the ground? We felt pretty confident about where we were. But, you know, you, there's your polling and then there's all the other polling that you're seeing, you know, in the newspapers and everything. I went out for coffee with Michael Hooley, who was in charge of Iowa for us. Um, he handed me a piece of paper and it had the number of households that he had identified as Kerry supporters. I still have that piece of paper in my wallet. And uh, it gave me a very, good, a very good and strong sense that I could have an okay day on, uh, on Iowa caucus day. And, you know, but beyond that, there was the feeling that, oh my God, if we win Iowa, we're going to New Hampshire, Governor Shaheen, 
and that we're going to go on and on and on. And this is going to take a really long time. So uh, anyway, it was a great moment, but you know, also a moment of a little dread. Real awakening. Yes, exactly. Well, how about you folks in the media? I mean, you, you spent a lot of time covering these folks on the planes and whatnot. Glenn, do you? There was one moment. I'll tell you about two, because one, I wasn't there, but I heard about it. And for reasons that will become obvious, uh, one of the things that candidates love to do is go into a city and try and go to the local haunt to show that they can identify with the people. And at one point in 2003, I believe it was, Senator Kerry went down to Philadelphia and dipped his toe into the famous cheesesteak wars there, Chino, Gino's and Pat's King of Steaks, and uh, ended up going over to Pat's and he ordered a cheesesteak. And the customary uh, question is, you know, with or without? And when they mean with, they mean with cheese whiz. And Senator Kerry ordered it with Swiss cheese. <laughs> and I wasn't there, but I heard from one of Steve Murphy's pals pretty quick there in the Gephardt campaign. Did you hear what just happened down in Philadelphia? Senator Kerry just ordered a cheesesteak with Swiss cheese. <laughs> and it sort of played into the caricature of Senator Kerry as sort of a continental figure. The other one was <laughs> continental. illustrative in that, and I was there for this, I was serving as the pool reporter. Uh, I actually covered Howard Dean during the primary, and uh, we were in Green Bay, and this was after a period when he had um, lost in Iowa, um, and I think lost in New Hampshire as well, and had put his flag in the ground saying that it was uh, Wisconsin or bust. And, and he declared that he was gonna, if he didn't win Wisconsin, something big was gonna happen, and it meant that he was gonna get out of the race. And so we went around and around and around with him. Does that mean you're gonna get out of the race? And he wouldn't really clearly answer the question, but he was in doing an interview with a local Green Bay station, and the reporter for the umpteenth time asked him, you know, if you lose Wisconsin, does that mean you're gonna get out? And I was sort of dozing there, you know, making notes as he went on, and, and he piped up and he said, no, it doesn't mean I'm going to get out. I'm going to stay in the race. And my head pivoted, and I looked over at one of his campaign staffers, Jay Carson, and his head pivoted over. <laughs> I'm like, wait, you're now saying you're going to get you're going to get in the race? He finished the interview, unbuckled his uh, unbuttoned his microphone, and turned around. Didn't even look at me. And he said, "I know, Glenn, a complete and utter contradiction." <laughs> and so we, we had this conversation, and uh, it was my responsibility to call out to the other reporters who were sitting in the next room waiting to hear what happened in this interview. And I said, Dean says he's not out, even though he said he was going to get out. And that triggered off a whole uh, news conference that he had to have. But it sort of got at the sort of, uh, you know, careening nature of his campaign towards the end. <laughs> And uh, the next day, he was going into the interviews, and, and one of his staffers asked me if I wanted to come in and serve the pool. Or he said, he's going to go do a series of local interviews, or as we now call them, strategy sessions. <laughs> <laughs> At least they're candid. Yeah, they were by that time. Now, Mary Beth, you always have a chance to do uh, equal time on these cheese wars or any of those other you things. Know, I'll reserve that for other, <laughs> other wars, not cheese wars. Ramesh. Well, I guess my, my great moment. Um, during this campaign, my brush with fame really was um, was on. I was getting on the the Bush press camp uh, campaign press plane, and Inside Edition, I guess, was doing as was working on a story on the sort of campaign reporters and their natural habitat. And this is one of those days where you, you wake up at three thirty in the morning in Crawford, and uh, you know, in order to clear security and get on the plane, so around about five thirty or six, I'm sleeping on the plane, and apparently they roll tape of me sleeping on the plane. I don't know whether a national audience has seen me drooling and snoring, but um, <laughs> if, it, if, it did, if it did appear, I don't really, uh, don't really want to know. And I, guess, I guess the other moment was when um, I met with the president late in 2003 with some of my colleagues, and he nicknamed me. I got one of those, fa those, uh, those limited supply presidential nicknames, uh, and he called me, not terribly creatively, ROM. And uh, this was the same nickname he'd used on me in the 2000 campaign. I couldn't tell whether he'd remembered that was his nickname for me if he just sort of spontaneously <laughs> regenerated it. But I have a presidential nickname. <laughs> Makes me feel good. That's a badge of honor. <laughs> uh, well, folks, um, if there's one thing you know as a candidate or as a campaign manager, is there's lots of available advice. Uh, candidates and campaign managers are absolutely bombarded by, uh, with advice. Uh, in a democracy, everybody can claim 
expertise, and they do. Uh, and, but the question tonight is uh, not what was the good advice, but uh, can you give us an example of uh, some of the bad advice, the really dumb advice, or the crazy advice that you were given? Uh, if you wish, you can name names, but we don't expect it. Uh, uh, I don't know, Ken, you want to start us again? or sure. what, we'll, or, uh, well, there are a couple, a couple examples. I wouldn't call it dumb. I think it was wrong advice. Uh, but uh, the first was, as Senator Kerry was winning week after week and primary after primary, uh, the impact was fantastic in terms of the coverage you received. I mean, every Tuesday night, if you turned on television, you knew John Kerry's a winner. He's winning around the country. And uh, we had a huge amount of folks out there that thought it would be a good idea for us to spend tens of millions of dollars on advertising uh, defining him. Uh, at that time, in, in February and in January, leading up before uh, March, he was a nominee, and that advice we, we rejected as we tried to, whenever people suggested we spend money that we didn't think we needed to spend. The second thing was, there was also a lot of pressure on us. I mentioned a minute ago that the speech at the convention, uh, we thought it was very important. Our experience in 2000 was we used March to lay out our agenda for the fall. And then by the time the fall came, you were much less effective at driving media because it was, reporters you know, been there, done that. And so we decided to wait till the convention uh, and the, frankly the speech the president gave at the convention to begin laying out our agenda for a new term. And uh, the, there was a huge amount of pressure uh, in, in Washington and around the country with folks very worried that uh, the president wasn't going to be able to uh, talk about the future. Uh, and so that was also something that we, it was a good point of view they had, but we ultimately rejected and I think it ultimately worked out pretty well. Mary Beth. Bad advice. <laughs> Well, what about John McCain for vice president? <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> that might have been a moment. Um, it's, it's funny, one night after the first debate, which I, I saw as a, a really big moment for our, our campaign, and, and you know, Senator Kerry obviously performed fantastically and, and uh, demonstrated um, to the country that he, he was well fit to lead the country in a, in a time of war. Um, I was riding back with him away um, in the limo, and I got an email from some unknown person. Now, the thing, the thing about get email now is the amount that you get from people you have no idea of who they are, it's astounding. And this one man emailed me and said, thank God you took my advice. <laughs> and, and, you know, I was unable, so I just handed it over to Senator Kerry and said, look. And he said, well, what was his advice? I don't remember. <laughs> I have no idea. So... I remember one, too. I, I remember talking to somebody in Senator Kerry's campaign, and the advice came from a celebrity, and it was that Senator Kerry, in order to help show his human side, should go on a cooking show <laughs> and show that he can cook. <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> Minus one Iowa, you never know. <laughs> Do you have anything to add, Ramesh? Did you overhear any of the... Well, just that, that Ken was too kind to mention that some of the pressure that the uh, campaign successfully resisted was from National Review, where I must have written five editorials saying, where's the agenda for the next term in the spring and the summer? So. <laughs> well, it's nice to talk about it with eight weeks to go, finally. Well, one of the things that uh, each of you face is working with... Uh, other, the, the press with the campaign management, the campaign management with the press. And in fact, for those that ride on the airplanes, it's a daily uh, and intense proposition. And the real question is, is how do you maintain uh, a professional relationship without it becoming personally bitter if there are bad articles? Or what, what are some of the complications that go along with that kind of a relationship of doing your job on both sides uh, professionally uh, when sometimes you might like to take the head off of the other person. I don't know, Mary Beth, if you want to. Um, and, to and to what degree did you personally, as head of the campaign, interact? Um, I think that starting out this campaign knowing you know, a fair number of reporters and have a, a relationship of trust with you know, people I had spoken to over the course of the year, that stood me in very good stead. And you know, worked well for me. I think it worked well for them. Some, some people. There has to be professionalism on both sides of that. And um, I think that reporters who had, been, who had seen more races, who had covered more campaigns, you know, had more insight and, and got less excited, I, th I think. And uh, so I think that it, when it's professional on both sides and you, give each, you both give each other a chance, you understand what the responsibilities are of both sides, then it works very well. Um, and you know, it's not always like that. 
Did you find the new, the, the inexperienced ones were less likely to sort of understand that professional relationship well, you know, or no, not? Right. No, I think that this is very much a, an individual matter. And, you know, there are lots of great young reporters covering the campaign for all sorts of outlets that didn't exist previously and gave us actually some of the, the best and widest ranging coverage, I thought. Um, but I think it's the, the sort of understanding of the professional role of, of both sides of this that, that makes it a relationship that works for everybody. Well, let's try, try one of our journalists and we'll go back to one of our, our campaign managers. Glenn, you want to? I mean, I had an incident with Senator Kerry back in uh, maybe 2001 or two, yeah, I think it was 2001, maybe 2002. It was when he was diagnosed with prostate cancer. It came during a period of the campaign when I was the only reporter traveling with him. And over that period, December to January, he, he hadn't looked right to me. And over a period of weeks, I asked the campaign manager and the press staff, is he sick? And they gave me a blanket denial. And I wrote a story, I was researching a story about the number of votes that he was missing early in January when Congress came back, uh, saying that this guy had you know, a perfect voting record virtually, and it was starting to go by the wayside because he had to start campaigning around the country. And as I did that, I asked a specific question. I said he missed the very first vote of Congress last year, this year, it was because he had any sort of medical appointment. And they went and researched it and came back and said, no, he did not have a medical appointment, but it was a personal matter and we can't tell you what it is. Uh, a couple weeks later, I saw him coming out of the Russell Center office building and I was following him down the hall as we often did. And uh, I asked him, you know, are you sick? And he looked at me and he said, why? <laughs> and I said, well, because you look like, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, he said, no. And then we continued talking, got in his car, and he was holding the door open, and I asked him again. I just said, well, all right. And about a week later, he came back and he announced that he had prostate cancer. And, and it turned out in the briefing material that they gave us that, in fact, the first meeting with the urologist was the day that he missed that vote. So... When he announced this, he had a news conference in the Senate press gallery, and I was in the front row, and he made his announcement and called on me uh, to ask the first question. And I asked him a question, you know, why did you lie? When I, when I, uh, I didn't think I used that term, I think I used mislead. Uh, when I asked you directly if you were sick, and we had an exchange that went back and forth, and at that time I didn't realize it, but it was on live TV. His wife was watching at home and she was very upset with me and his daughters were watching and they were very upset with me and he was pretty clearly upset with me. We were supposed to have an interview afterwards that didn't happen. And uh, we went our separate ways, but he went in and had his surgery. I was at the hospital when he checked in at 6 o'clock the, the next day in the, in, the, <laughs> in the dark up in Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And then three weeks later I was also out on the Fox studio lot in Los Angeles when he made his return and he spoke to a fundraising group. And I remember him coming out and I was like, oh, here it comes. And uh, he said, will you sit with me in my car because I can't stand up for that long right now. So we sat in the car and we basically talked over the incident. And, uh, and I think it was, you know, declared a truce. You know, I mean, the, the, he had his position and, you know, he wanted to tell his family first and didn't want it to break in the newspaper. And I felt that, uh, that there was a way around this, especially since, I, since I'd been traveling with him so long, to, to directly lie or, you know, when I had asked specific questions, you know, linked to specific events. And we just went past that. But it was a personally difficult moment for both of us, but something that happens quite often in campaigns. But, did, but, but by his following up and that conversation in the car, did that, in your view, make a big difference or not? I think it just put an <clears throat> end point on, on a dispute. And... Uh, you know, we both stood our ground and went on, and you know, I covered the rest of his campaign virtually and, and uh, you know, enjoyed, continued to enjoy the ability to talk to him pretty much whenever I wanted, so. Great. Ken. One of the lessons here, I think, is that the line between a reporter and a stalker is a fine one. <laughs> <laughs> sure sounds like a, sure sounds like <laughs> Senator Kerr would have been justified getting a restraining order. Uh, I, I think Mary Beth uh, hit the nail on the head. I think, look, uh, the press has a job to do and we have a job to do. And if you recognize that and you're professional about it, uh, it works. Uh, Nicole Devinish was our communications director and one of the reasons that, that I wanted her to take that job was because I thought she had a really good attitude toward the press, which was, uh, we got a story to tell, 
and you got a job to do, and let's work together. And we tried very hard as a campaign to be open and to you never lie to the press. You always tell them the truth. If you've got bad news, you tell them it up front. And uh, I felt like, uh, I, I think that certainly the, there were parts of the covers that I didn't love. Uh, but at the end of the day, I felt like uh, if, if you view it that way, if you recognize that everybody has a job to do, it can work. The other thing that's happened is that because there are so many networks now, and because of cables, and because of talk radio, and because of the web, because of all these different sources of news, there's more competition for information, which I think uh, can be beneficial to uh, a campaign in getting its information out. In the old days when there was a monopoly of three networks, uh, it was much less likely uh, that you could, you know, basically you had three people you had to deal with, and if it didn't work out, you had a problem. Today, uh, there's more sources and more ways to, to get around the filter, uh, as the president uh, once said. Well, Ramesh, uh, I don't know if you want to declare you're not a stalker or not, but, but uh, you, were, you were, had a little different uh, position as uh, writing for a, a political opinion journal. Uh, can you give us any insight in how you saw your role or, or the difficulties of, of making that work? Well, you know, the, um, there is sometimes a, a belief on the part of uh, Republican uh, political consultants and candidates that the role of a conservative media is to cheerlead. And uh, you know, you're supposed to be on the team. And when we fail to play that role because we don't regard it as our role, um, sometimes uh, uh, people you know, ex express themselves uh, pretty, pretty uh, strongly. Although, actually, from the, from the Bush campaign, the most we ever got was certain unnamed advisors saying that they were disappointed with, uh, with various things we do. What we, what we found much more often was that readers were upset. You know, if we said, you know, that the, the president's performance in the debate was less than, you know, stellar, then uh, people would be, you know, I actually I remember got one email saying, you know, how dare you attack our beloved president? <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, that, that, that would certainly make my coverage fairly boring for the next, uh, <laughs> the next couple of weeks. But, um, but it, both campaigns, uh, we were treated completely professionally. Well, I can't resist turning some of the questions to uh, for our young people uh, because that's a focus of what the Institute of Politics uh, does. And uh, uh, one of the, uh, the major events of this was the, the increased participation by young voters and young people in the political campaigns. It looked like there was a significant revival this year. Some 21 million voted. It was 4.6 million more than in 2000. Uh, and uh, I guess I want to ask you, uh, from inside the campaign, looking out at young voters, uh, can you tell us anything about the perspective you had, uh, how you uh, reached out, or whether you th thought they were uh, the significant force? Because a lot of consultants in previous years had said you can't count much on the young voters. Um, I, I, we had a <laughs> big effort to reach out to young voters. We had a huge uh, on-campus operation uh, all over the country. Uh, I think that uh, it is very important to reach out to young voters. I think that the idealism, uh, the enthusiasm that young folks have is, is, is great in the political process. And I think that from my perspective, uh, I think that the president and, and Republicans have a message that resonates with young Americans uh, if we're effective at delivering that message. And we can always do better, and we will continue to do that. But I think that reaching out to young voters is extremely important. It was a big part of our campaign. They provide a lot of our ground troops. Uh, and we had big on-campus operations and we'll continue to have it going forward. We look for every way possible to um, communicate with young voters because we thought the more of them that voted, voted, the more of a plurality there would be for John Kerry. And actually that turned out to be the case. Among uh, voters 18 to 30, uh, Al Gore won that group by plus two. Kerry won it by nine. And so I think that that is a great thing because especially with the first time you cast your presidential vote, it has a lot to do with how you're going to vote for the rest of your life. Um, we use the internet very extensively, more every day uh, in the course of the campaign, and I think really that's one of the very big innovations of this campaign cycle. And it, we used it importantly for organizational purposes. Obviously, you know, you've seen in the paper and we've t we have talked about how much emphasis we put on raising small dollar donations over the internet. But really, if you lived in a, in a blue state, if you lived in California, and we had an event in Portland, Oregon that we were trying to do turnout for, the calls were made by people from California who got a list from our online volunteer center. And it gave an awful lot of people a chance to participate um, outside of the battleground states. But it also was used extensively by the youngest cohort of voters. I think that that's something that's going to be built on a lot. And I think it's a very hopeful sign for the Democratic Party. I would just add one more thing, which is this is the first year in a long time where what happened on the ground was 
as important and it received as much emphasis as what happened on the air and in the news. I think that that is a great thing for both parties. I think it, I know it was an incredibly part, important part of our campaign and of the Bush-Cheney campaign, and it bodes very well for people wanting to be involved in campaigns, and especially younger people. I, I, I want to just make one other point on that, and I could not agree more with what you just said. Uh, that's so important. Uh, when you think about it, technology uh, has a, is a huge driver in politics. And the effect of television was to, in many ways, replace the political organization and replace a lot of the grassroots that used to happen in politics. And what's exciting about the web and about the new technology is that it's returning people back to the grassroots and back to the basics of politics. And uh, we found, at least, that people are a lot less likely to watch television. They're more likely to filter it out. And so if you can build a big web-based grassroots campaign, it's amazing what you can accomplish. I totally agree. And it's also a great way for people to get involved who don't have to go down to headquarters, who don't have to know somebody, who can just go to, go to the website and become involved. So I, I think we are in strong agreement on that. Some of the best things of the campaign, one is the people that you meet along the way, both in the media, in my case, or within the campaign organizations. But it's also, by far, I think, the people throughout the country that you see along the way. And so often, it's young people. And in the New Hampshire primary or the Iowa caucuses, it was, I was always struck by the number of people who were in a campaign headquarters in an odd hour of the night or early morning, working for little or no pay, um, fueled by belief. And, and as you would continue through the campaign, the crowds would get bigger. And I remember some of the times in, uh, this past summer, uh, we did a tour with Senator Kerry uh, in, in July, around the 4th of July holiday through Minnesota and Wisconsin, and driving through these towns at all hours of the day or night and seeing people lining the roads, you know, for a chance to see a bus go by. And it, it really, for me, uh, the, the thing that I like the most about going out every four years is, is the renewal and that sense of, of optimism or belief in the country. When you get out there and you hear people stand up and tell stories about their lives and why this election is important to them, and when you see people give up portions of their lives. I mean, Howard Dean had people who worked at Goldman Sachs and, and major law firms in Washington who just dropped everything and went and worked on his campaign for nothing. And that tells you something about the stakes that they saw in the election and the personal commitment they would want to make. I'm, I took my sons uh, to see John Kerry's speech at the convention here in Boston. And I'll never forget the look on their face. They were down in the press stand with me, and so we were sort of you know, to the side of John Kerry. And when he would speak and the crowd would return a roar, to see their faces when they would hear sound that they had never heard before, and to think of the inspiration and the chatter that started among them, I was glad they were there for that. And uh, if anybody has not done that, it is truly a life-altering experience to uh, work in a campaign in any facet, either as a reporter helping cover it uh, or as somebody who's uh, you know, helping the candidates try to achieve their goals. I, I think that the Democrats get insufficient credit for the tactical brilliance of raising the draft issue. That is the idea that um, the president, uh, if reelected, would would see, oversee a revival of the draft. I think that that really did hit a lot of young voters where they lived. And, uh, and I think that the Republicans were clearly worried about that issue. I mean, the president went out of his way during the debates to address that, um, and he addressed it repeatedly. Uh, and, I, and I think that uh, political analysts have tended to underestimate the impact of that issue. I agree. I think that that, that was something that, that worked. It was not true, uh, but it worked. And uh, <laughs> I wish we had done more to address it, because uh, I think that it, it had an impact among some young voters. Well, the extraordinary thing about this campaign was the re-energizing of, of millions of citizens, both as voters and as workers in campaigns that, that uh, frankly, wasn't expected four years ago or six years ago, I think, in our political cycles. We thought that we were, unfortunately, headed the opposite direction. But let's open it up now to our audience. Uh, we have four microphones, one here, one up there, one there, and one here. And the way we will proceed is we ask people to very briefly identify themselves and ask a short question. And of course, a question ends with a question mark. That's how you distinguish it from a speech. Uh, and uh, please, uh, if you know to whom you wish to direct it, please say so in the process. And we'll try to limit everybody to one question because I suspect we will have a number of people that would like to get into this uh, conversation. So yes, sir. 
Apu, I'm a HBS alum. Uh, the question is around press relations because of the panel, I have to ask this question. What were the top do's and don'ts of the relation between the campaign and the press? Because on one hand, we hear this thing about access and access can be cut off. On the other side, the press obviously has an incredible influence. So what were the top do's and don'ts while you were dealing with the press? Well, that's sort of a general. Whenever you want to start. <laughs> I, mean, I think that number one on both sides is honesty back and forth. I think that uh, if, if I'm straight with a campaign, I'd like them to be straight back with me. And I think that, that that's vital to developing any sort of relationship. Once you feel that a campaign isn't telling you the truth, um, it, uh, it inhibits your ability to do your work and it doesn't give you confidence in the things that they'll say coming down the road. And they don't want that, and certainly you don't want that. You know, it is not, they're not going to you know, give you the state secrets uh, every day, but I think there has to be a free exchange. You know, if they want to use the free organ of the media to get their message out, they also have to be willing to submit to questions about what's going on in their organization and be honest in their answers. And for the most part, I think you know, the campaigns were, you know, lived up to that standard. I would add to that that I think that you have to understand that there are two sides to this relationship. And just because we as the campaign might want to wait to announce when something, you know, when we're going to go forward with something, if, if the news pops, you have to react to it. And you have to react to it quickly. And, you know, not fight it. Just, you know, go along with it. Because this is a, an interchange in a relationship that's going to go on over the course of, you know, months and years in the case of someone like Senator Kerry or the president. Uh, third point is the, the press, the, the, you know, every group has conventional wisdom among them, and the press is no, no different. And there are things that the press generally tends to believe. And so if you're, as a campaign, want to argue something, and you can argue it two ways, one way, a way that they tend to believe, and another way, a way which is arguing against the wind, uh, it's very important to think about what their th psyche is in making the argument you're going to make, because you'll go a lot further than, than, than trying to argue to them, as opposed to uh, explain something which is consistent with their worldview. Yes. Jim Levine, Harvard College, class of 2006. I'm interested to hear what the panelists think were the two biggest mistakes made by each campaign, and retrospectively, maybe how they could have uh, done better. Well, we talked about this a little earlier. And when I think back on the campaign, the one thing, if it were possible for me to change it, it would be the scheduling of the conventions. Ours took place the last week of July. and the um, President's Convention took place in early September. And thus, for five weeks, we were operating within the general election, and they were still in the primary. If there was one thing that I could do over again, it would, that was a, a huge hill to get over. And um, that is something that I would change from a scheduling point of view. Now, obviously, because we were a challenger, we were involved in um, a very contentious Democratic primary, we weren't thinking about that when, uh, last year. But you know, as an incumbent president, the, the Bush-Cheney White House you know, planned brilliantly, I think, for, to take advantage of that period of time. Uh, I think it's interesting you, you asked that. We said a minute ago, I think the fact that we should have responded more forcefully on the draft issue. Uh, I think that uh, that was a mistake. And uh, that was something that, as I said, the president never said it. He repeatedly said it wasn't true. Uh, Secretary Rumsfeld said it wasn't true. But we should have more forcefully responded. And I think we would have done better among uh, 18 to 30-year-olds had we done that. Yes. Uh, my name is Brian Richardson. I'm a, a student at the Kennedy School, and I'm a co-chair of the Kennedy School Democrats. I had a question about the, uh, the Swift Boat Veterans for Truth. Uh, I think in hindsight, they had a, uh, uh, a more damaging effect on the Kerry campaign than anybody anticipated when they first came out with their ads. Um, both from the campaign's perspective and the press perspective, um, what did you think of those ads when they first came out? Um, and from the campaign perspective, um, did, uh, did you plan on, uh, especially in the Kerry campaign, did you plan on responding to them earlier, or was it a strategic decision to wait? Well, why don't I start on this one? <laughs> um, when that buy was first made, it was $40,000. Uh, and it was in two states. And it was a, it was a very tough ad and a very hard-hitting ad. Um, but it really didn't go anywhere. And then it got picked up by particularly the Fox network and then by other cable channels and got run in the news again and again and again. And then all of a sudden, it was a much bigger deal. 
This is the best $40,000 uh, investment ever made by any political group. Uh, it, but it was only because of the news coverage that it got to where it did. We thought at first, for the first day or two, there's no reach to this. We're not going to respond to it. But once it, became, once it got on the national cables in a very serious way, in story after story, um, obviously uh, Senator Kerry came to the firefighters convention here in Boston and addressed it very forcefully and very personally. Then uh, following up with that, we ran a series of, of ads, which actually took out of our general election funds uh, that we had to defend on this, from Judy Droz, the wife of a, of a fallen comrade of uh, Senator Kerry's, and uh, from Ambassador um, Peterson, testifying as people who had been there. Um, so it did have a bigger effect than we originally thought. More than that, it gave the Swift Boat Veterans for Truth as an organization, and perhaps they'll be here tomorrow, I don't know, as a, one of the 527s. They raised a vast amount of money over the news, uh, out of the news coverage that they got. I don't think that any of their other ads had as much impact as, as their first one, but they would bring that back every so often, cycle it into their buy. So. Anybody else want to comment on that? I, I think that it, it had an impact for, for two reasons, uh, in addition to what, what you said. I, you're totally right. I mean, it's, it's interesting how an ad, the, the, the pickup and the discussion of an ad gets more intense, intense focus on the ad. But the other two reasons, I think, one is because Senator Kerry had put so much focus on that part of his biography. Uh, that I thought that it, it, it brought it out as an issue. And then the second was that I thought that, if you remember, may remember, uh, we had, there was a press conference that was held by Wesley Clark, and I forget who the other uh, surrogate for the campaign was, and they attacked the president's service at the time of the Vietnam War. And the response of uh, one of the spokesmen for the Kerry campaign was to say, they've earned their right to speak. And I think what a lot of people, when they saw that, they said, well, wait a minute, if they haven't earned their right, to, if they've earned their right to speak, having the Swift Boat veterans earn their right to speak too. So I think those two things added to, both from a press perspective and a public perspective, why it was a, uh, a bigger story. Can I make another point on this? This discussion went on even after the allegations in the Swift Boat ads were disproved. Um, William Rood, who's an editor at, at the Chicago Tribune, was actually a Swift Boat captain at the same time and was at the engagement uh, that was mentioned in the ad. Um, he wrote a front page story after having, having never spoken about this during the course of his life as a newsman. And point by point rebutted the ad because none of the Swift Boat veterans actually served with Kerry or, with, or were with Kerry. And despite the fact that it was dis disproved point by point, the back and forth was covered day to day in the press and it didn't step back at all on the cable networks. It, it went off the broadcast networks lar uh, by and large but uh, it was still part of the news coverage. Um, and that, for me, is, it, is a very big change. The fact that it was disproved and it was still, every day, part of the coverage. Mary Beth, going back to the previous question as to whether you think there was an error in the campaign or not on this issue, a lot of outsiders trying to give advice argued that the, the senator's campaign was very slow in giving intense response. Uh -huh. You sort of addressed that, but do you see, in retrospect, that that was a mistake. We went at this very strong every day um, through all of our very talented um, communications and press people. And, you know, talking points to all of our surrogates, we, we put um, Carrie's crewmates out on all of the news networks. We had other people who had served with him out. But we didn't want him to address it mm -hmm. because we didn't want to make it that big a story. It wasn't there yet. Well, I mean, in hindsight, maybe we should have put them out earlier because then we could have cut it. We could have cut it off earlier. But uh, you know, from my experience of this, I'm not sure that that's true because there was, you know, a, there was a part of the press that was extremely interested in this story, and it just kept going, and they kept covering it. Yes. Uh, my name is Herman Sood. I'm at the medical school at the MGH, and I would like to ask Ms. Cahill if she would comment on the rationale for at least my perception of the decision by the Kerry campaign not to deal with the what I thought was an incredible statement by President Bush that Iran was part of the axis of evil because it would seem to me that this was an overt gift to the radical uh, fundamentalist in Iran to proceed with nuclear weapons to become progressively more uh, antagonistic towards our policy. 
And I thought that this was given very little coverage, and it would seem to me that this would have been a very valuable point. And I would like to know how it was that this and some other things were taken pretty much off the screen. Okay. One of the things that, when we looked at this campaign from the beginning, from my perspective, 9-11 really was the overarching event of this campaign. And voters saw President Bush through a prism of 9-11, and they perceived almost every interchange between the campaigns through that lens. Almost every fo foreign policy question that we address, that we addressed how we decided to do it, were very much part of the difficulty of our making an overt um, slogan for change. The voters were extremely leery of it. They were extremely leery of, of, of especially earlier in the campaign, this, this changed very much in the fall, of an international discussion. It was, it was very much, what about me? What about my safety? Who is going to keep me safer? And they, in, in no way, were open to the sort of back and forths early on about international affairs. That changed once Iraq really blew up. And uh, Kerry, Senator Kerry is obviously tremendously interested in international affairs. He um, would have gave a series of speeches on Iraq and, and, uh, and uh, the Middle East and you know, our situation in the world. But the change argument and, and the, the political implications of that were, you know, were, were a difficulty that we dealt with every day in the course of the campaign. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Lauren Lycan. I'm a second year student at the Kennedy School. I have a question for the campaign managers um, about your relationships to the candidates. And specifically, I'm wondering what happens when there's a fundamental disagreement between the two of you and when, when one of you adamantly mm -hmm. believes in one strategy and the candidate believes in another strategy, who wins? And <laughs> how, does that, how does that process take place? Um, well, when you disagree, he wins and you get yelled at. Uh, no, on, on a I, I'm, I worked for, the, for Governor Bush back starting in 1999, in, in, uh, and one of the things about the president that he very much respects are people that come and give him what their honest opinion is. I mean, he doesn't want uh, yes men around him who just tell him what he wants to hear. And uh, anyone who's worked for him knows, uh, and he actually does it by asking lots of questions. When you go to him and you say, I want you to do this, he'll ask you about 15 questions, rapid fire, and that's how he makes decisions, by, by asking those questions and making judgments. Um, but we were certainly were in a position where, working for him for this long, you know what he fundamentally thinks, what he wants to do, what his broad principles and what his goals are. Uh, he's not someone who gets into the minutiae and into the tactics, do this, do that. Uh, but he sets broad goals, and when he feels strongly about something, obviously your job is to serve him. Uh, and look, if, if I want to be a candidate, I'll run for office. But at the end of the day, my job is to work on behalf of uh, the people that are putting themselves up to be the elected official. And uh, you try to tell them, him or her what you think, but at the end of the day, obviously, they have to make the decision that's right because their name's on the ballot. I agree with everything Ken said from the <laughs> him being in charge to everything else. Um, the thing that really impressed me, I, I had known John Kerry for a long period of time, but really not well. Um, I actually worked on a Senate race against him in 1984 when, when he ran and was elected the first time. Um, I never saw a human being work harder than John Kerry did uh, in the course of this campaign, especially during the sort of torrential waterfall of the early primaries, where it wasn't possible to give him too much to do or too many things, that, that, because this was something that he wanted, changing the country was something that he wanted to do so much that there was, there was no request that was, you know, that, that went too far. That, I, I grew to respect him enormously during the, the course of that period of time, and that stood us in good stead as we went, you know, into the, into the general election, into the conventions, you know, into really a much larger stage. But uh, it's, it, was, it was his campaign, and uh, the candidate, you know, really does have the final say. Yes. Um, I wanted to... I have questions for both campaign managers. Um, both of you faced considerable challenges when you took on your jobs. Mr. Melman, you took on a job that Karl Rove had done four years before, and he was still 
he was still under the employee of the president. I was wondering how you and Mr. Rove divided responsibilities from the campaign. Ms. Kale, you took on the campaign after the staff, he had reorganized his whole staff, and I was wondering what challenges you faced and if you have any comments on that. Um, you I'll start first. Okay. I mean, I walked in, and Governor Shaheen is here, and she was the chairperson of our campaign, and I could, we couldn't have asked for a better one. And she was very much a part of my becoming the manager. Um, and she came with me to my first staff meeting on Monday morning as this you know, shocked staff assembled for a change of leadership and a change of campaign. Now, this is something that had really played out in, through, in the newspapers. And you know, there was a lot of anxiety and a lot of fear, really, among the people who, who work there. Um, but they were really smart, and they were really good, and they were really committed to John Kerry. And so after the first day, I said to Jeannie, oh, I'm not sure I'm going to last through this. Um, but they all came together. We came up with a plan to get us through Iowa and New Hampshire, which was the critical matter at hand. And then we really never looked back. Um, and uh, Jean and, uh, and Senator Kerry really supported me through that. And you know, I said, as was reported some, you know, I want you to stay. I hope you stay. If you don't want to stay, leave now. Because you know, we're going forward here, and I think we're going to win. So it was all easier after that first day. <laughs> the, the, the challenge that we faced, and it, it really is a challenge, is, is running a re-election campaign. Because in some ways, you're like a colony. Uh, and one of the things we did before we started is we did a lot of research. And we looked at how past re-election campaigns had been structured. Uh, we looked at how decisions had been made. And we set up a structure that worked well. I've worked for Carl since uh, 1999. I was the, political director at the White House and reported to him. And so we had a really good working relationship. So it was very helpful to making it work well. But when I was asked to run the campaign, I thought it was very important, because looking at what had happened in previous campaigns, for it to be clear that who was in charge of what, uh, to be clear who were the decision makers, to be clear how we would work with the White House. And so th the first thing I said is, I want to make sure if I'm in charge that I'm in charge of who gets hired and fired, and I'm in charge of how money is spent. Because if you're in charge of spending and hiring, you're running the campaign. And uh, we had a regular process by which we had lots of communication with the White House. We had key people that made decisions. We uh, let them hash it out and argue about things. And then we stuck with our decisions. But the structure of the campaign, uh, having a clear person in charge of the campaign, having the people who had to help make decisions at the White House and at the campaign, talking on a regular basis and planning on a regular basis, was incredibly important to our success. I will tell you that a re-election is much harder to do than an election. It, it's not even comp comparable. It's so much more difficult because of the fact that there's so many more people who participate, because you're in D.C. as opposed to outside of D.C. Uh, and finally, it's more difficult because of the fact that, as I said, while you're an organization, you ultimately serve a White House, which is a separate organization. So uh, I thought we had a good structure, but it was, it, that was, we spent a lot of time thinking about that. Yes. Hi, my name is Scott Taylor. I'm a first year student here at Kennedy School. I'd be interested in hearing from the campaign manager specifically how you prepared your candidates for the first debate and whether that preparation uh, process changed for the subsequent debates. We, we put a lot of emphasis on the debates. We knew that, you know, from our point of view, the president was going around the country talking about a straw man who was not the John Kerry that we knew and, and that, you know, that we were uh, advocating for. And these moments, when they were together on the same stage, were very important to us. Um, and Senator Kerry deeply invested in taking the time and preparing for them. We gave him, I, I gave him a memo early on suggesting a pretty small group who would prepare him and a pretty rigorous schedule of preparation which was removed very much time out of the campaign. Now this was, you know, sort of, uh, not, it, it was sort of controversial within the campaign to, because for each of them we went off the road for three days. And we went off the road in Spring Green, Wisconsin, outside of Denver, Colorado, and uh, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So, and it really worked for us because there were no other distractions in Wisconsin, neither the cell phones nor the Blackberries worked. 
And that was a wonderful moment. It felt like a vacation, in all truth. Um, but Kerry did mock debate after mock debate, was, did an enormous amount of reading beforehand. And I think that all of that showed off um, in, in um, his performance in the debate, and especially, especially the first one. We kept up the same group of people through in Senator Edwards' debate also, which, because it, this really was a package of four, and it was the same group uh, with the several editions that prepared him. Uh, we benefited from the fact that we had done this before four years ago. And so we knew what model worked in terms of briefing the president the most. We also benefited from the fact that he'd been president for four years. So on a lot of these policy issues, he was regularly updated and regularly informed about things. Uh, same kind of process, relatively small group that's involved. In fact, it was the same group that was involved in 2000 who knew what worked best. Uh, the president's someone who likes to read a lot, and so as a result, we had a briefing book for him that ultimately, each time he would go through it was honed and changed based on his comments and his suggestions. Uh, and uh, he did some of it on his own, but we did a lot of it as part of the process, too. Uh, and uh, I think what, what you said is exactly right. I mean, the key to it is the candidate's got to be comfortable with the process. It's got to be the best way for them to, to, to gain information and them to practice and them to work it. Uh, and, and finally, uh, it's got to be something that adapts and changes based on how you do as each debate goes and you get new information. There's also um, a lot of concern, I know, in both campaigns, but we know more intimately from the Kerry campaign about what you want to talk about and when you want to talk about it and what you want to raise and, and what you don't want to raise. And the, getting back to the swift boat issue, there was some discussion there, and I think one of the lines that never was used, I don't know if Mary Beth will confirm it, was that, was that I think if there would have been an opportunity where the moderator posed a question to Senator Kerry about it, he was fully prepared to say to President Bush or just to the general audience, uh, I've never seen so many people who didn't serve attack the service of those who did. And I think that he felt he could not bring up that line on his own for fear of drumming, you know, drumming up criticism that he was relying too heavily on his war record. But I know that the swift boat thing tore away at him and that he hoped at some point to try and be able to address that. I think he was wary of you know, renewing some of the Vietnam War conflict uh, between those who, who went and those who did not. And so, you know, he never took that opportunity to use that, but there were a lot of things that they talked about and sort of plotted uh, that, that never came to be just because either the format or the numbers of questions that were asked or the way the questions were asked. Well, that's the first time I ever heard that line. So, <laughs> so whoever told you that? We actually didn't try that many lines because, first of all, it's not, something that Senator Kerry is that comfortable with. He did approach this with so much seriousness that you know, this was not an election where uh, you know, your no John Kennedy was gonna, was gonna turn a debate. This was a much more in-depth discussion of the issues from our point of view and particularly from Kerry's. So we really spent very little to no time on lines and that was a decision that we discussed really early and then never revisited. Talking about campaign mistakes earlier, and, and I do wonder whether it was a mistake for the Bush campaign to want to talk about foreign policy first. I mean, that was a set of topics that was, I think, most likely to get Bush showing a kind of lack of respect for uh, his opponent in a way that would uh, would be unattractive to voters. I remember I talked to a Republican strategist the day, you know, several hours before that first debate, saying, you know, if this doesn't go well tonight, I think there's going to be a lot of second guessing about that decision. We have time for two more questions only, I'm sorry, but yes. My name is Benjamin Bolger, and I'm a graduate student at Harvard. And um, I want to ask you a question about stem cell research. It's a fairly complicated and nuanced debate. And I was wondering what you felt as campaign managers as to what political value, political gains, or losses might be had with raising the issue as it was in the campaigns. Uh, well, I thought that, I think that the president's statement he made in 2001, he gave a speech, you may remember, uh, from Texas. I thought it was one of the finest speeches he's given as president because it really reflected uh, deep thinking on his part and real consideration of the issues at, at, at issue here uh, with respect to stem cell, which was the need to balance scientific research and be the first administration ever to fund it with real ethical concerns that people had. And I thought that, uh, that the, frankly, that 
the way some of the press covered it and the way our opponents covered it was, was, was frankly not a good service to the country or to anybody because, you know, how many times did you hear George Bush is a, in favor of banning all stem cell research, which is not his position? Uh, it's a nuanced issue. I think the president has a position which is both nuanced and principled. And uh, I think that um, most people that listened to it uh, heard that from the president. I'm so happy to hear nuance from the Bush campaign. <laughs> <laughs> um, we advertised on stem cell research on, we had I think three ads on stem cells because we ran in the general election um, spots that were specific to states. And Michael J. Fox, who is one of the foremost advocates for increased research beyond the 21 lines that are currently in use um, in federal laboratories, strongly felt as though there needed to be an expansion of those lines that, that are available to scientists. And this is something that Kerry felt very deeply about and it was actually part of his speeches over the course of the, um, of the, of the spring and during the, pro the primary process. And you know, it was a pretty significant difference between the two of us. It's something people believe deeply in the possibilities of, of that offered by stem cell research for you know, curing disease. And, and so we thought it was an important thing and we, have, we actually spent money on it. One last question here. Sure. My name is Shanta Bahan and I'm a student at the Divinity School and a professor of world religions. And I was wondering what the respective campaigns did to reach out to the Arab American and Muslim American communities this year? Well, actually, we, I can start with this, which um, we, for the first time, we had um, a very robust, I was the public liaison um, director in the, in the Clinton White House, so I have a deep belief in, in keeping in touch with different communities around the country and the sort of dialogue, the benefit, it benefited President Clinton and it definitely benefited Senator Kerry in the course of this. So we had um, a, an Arab American uh, liaison um, George Kavork, and he actually performed brilliantly, and he did something that worked really well for Clinton in the White House, and that was he organized a series of small meetings, not for public, um, not for any public uh, process, for the campaign to talk to Arab Americans, especially about things like racial profiling, and you know the the situation in the airports. Um, you know, the fact that they were getting stopped all the time. And that was a, something of deep pain to, uh, to these people. And they wanted to make sure that Kerry knew it and it was reflected. And so we actually had um, a series of meetings or, uh, organized by George and um, Mona Pasquale of our public liaison office. And you know, that helped us and informed our views. Uh, we also had a very a robust uh, process. We had a lot of surrogates around the country that did events for us. We had a coalition department at the campaign that was actually headed by an Iranian American who didn't just do Arab outreach but did other outreach too. Uh, and we around the country held meetings, held events, did voter registration, uh, did organizing. One of the interesting things that a lot of folks don't realize is that in one of the most important target states, Michigan, there's a very large population of Chaldeans uh, who are uh, Iraqi uh, Christians. Uh, they're Arabs or Christians, they're not Muslims mostly, and uh, are strongly supportive of the liberation of Iraq. And you, what you have is in a lot of, in that community, a lot of people who's themselves and their families suffered under Saddam Hussein's brutality and very much appreciated uh, the president's leadership in building a coalition that liberated that nation. So uh, we had a very robust effort based on uh, one of the president's key principles, which is the notion that democracy and freedom are not Western concepts, but should apply all around the world. And a lot of Arab American and Muslim Americans who have come to this country on behalf of freedom respected a president that said uh, that their relatives, their friends, and the place they came from ought to have the same rights that folks have in this country. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, help me thank our panelists who each in his or her way has contributed to making our democracy work. Thank you. trying to place your accent. Really?